welcome to a very special edition of Spy Hards Podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam, the provocateur. And Cam, we are revisiting Tomorrow Never Dies with a special guest. That's right. We have with us writer, director, and novelist Nicholas Meyer. Now, as we've said on the podcast before, Scott and I first met at a Star Trek convention. And so Nicholas Meyer was a very exciting get for us because he is the writer-director of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, two of the best in the franchise, as well as the writer of Star Trek IV um, The Voyage Home. So this was this was ultra exciting. Scott, how did you make this happen? How did you do it? Uh, it, was, it was fairly easy. I sent an email and he replied. That is the most exciting story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Strap yourselves in, folks. Uh, but yeah, it was just as simple as that. I, um, I I proposed the idea of speaking about Tomorrow Never Dies because I was fascinated about the fact that he uh, assisted in putting together the film. Yeah. Anyone who listened to our episode on Tomorrow Never Dies may recall that um, Bruce Firestein is the credited writer on Tomorrow Never Dies. But because the movie was under a real crunch with its deadline... Um, Eon reached out to several writers to come in and try to basically get this thing banged into shape for shooting. And Nicholas Meyer was among the talent that they approached. And so when Cam said to me, Nicholas Meyer was involved in one of my favorite of the Brosnan films, uh, I just jumped at the chance because, well, he wrote my favorite Star Trek film and my second favorite Brosnan film. So I thought I'd send the email and here we are. Yeah, and so we had a really cool chat that we can't wait for you all to hear. But um, I think it's a really interesting look at just sort of what happens on the peripheries of writing these big movies where I think a lot of the average people see a name on you know the credits and go, well, that person wrote it all. Whereas often there's problems that need to be solved. And Nicholas Meyer is a guy who, aside from his illustrious career writing you know novels and films and directing films as well, um, has often pitched in just to problem solved scripts along the way. Yeah, it's a real sort of view of uh, how the sausage is made. Mm, or the banger. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so here we are, folks. Here's our chat with Nicholas Meyer. We talk about Tomorrow Never Dies, the wider spy movie and spy book world, and then just about everything else afterwards. We hope you enjoy and we'll see you on the other side. Well, I guess we were very interested just in the role you played in Tomorrow Never Dies and how you sort of got affiliated with the project, whoever I played Bond. <laughs> I should have known. I should have known. Um, my brother-in-law, I had two connections, three connections with the Bond movie. So particular order. One was the uh, United Artists executive in charge of the production, whose name was Jeff Kleeman. Jeff Kleeman and involved me and my movie volunteers to come and speak uh, at Yale. And this was the beginning of a friendship that has endured until this, this day. Um, later, I helped him get his first job in Hollywood, more or less. And that was the beginning of an awesome career rise. And at the time that you're talking about, he was in charge of these James Bond movies. I think he did four of them, ones with Pierce Brosnan. Pierce had been my friend since 1987 when I directed him in the deceivers in India for a merchant ivory. Right. We've been friends ever since as well. I tend to keep friends. <laughs> um, the film was directed by my, a guy I call my brother-in-law once removed, Roger Spottiswood. So those are my connections. Um, I got a call from Jeff Kleeman uh, at some point who said, we're having some script issues. Would you like a, you know, trip to London? We'll put you up at the Dorchester. Never turned down a trip to the Dorchester. Hmm. Um, and 
I went and I discovered that I was not alone, that a, a whole gaggle of writers had been summoned. I don't remember all of them, but Kurt Schwimmer was one and Leslie Dixon was another. Uh, and, and I'm sure there were other sort of notorious characters in the group. And we were told um, what does the, the, the question they were dealing with was, what does the villain want? Oh, okay. And remember, the villain, remember two things. Why, what does the villain want? And remember, the villain has already wanted the gold in Fort Knox, control of the oceans, control of atom bombs, control of outer space. And number two, keep it simple. So that was the, that was the assignment. So I went to the Dorchester uh, um, and in a somewhat jet lagged state, I had an epiphany. I knew how to fix it. I solved the problem. Uh, the offices of Eon, which is the Barbara Broccoli uh, operation, which is Bond, were within walking distance of the Dorchester on Piccadilly. So I walked and in a room where Barbara and Jeff Kleeman and Roger Spottiswood and Roger's, uh, uh, Barbara's uh, stepbrother um, oh, Michael were G. all Michael there. G. there. There were about 30 people. And I said, here's my idea. And by the way, this is my whole story. This is it. Um, all James Bond movies are essentially as rigid in their format and structure as an English sonnet. We open with a spectacular pre-credit sequence amazing stunt, followed by credits, followed by Bond arrives and banters with Money Penny outside M's office. Bond banters with M, gets assignment, uh, goes to Q, finds gadgets, and then we have action sequence, action sequence, action sequence, and finally we get to the meeting with Mr. Big, who says, no, Mr. Bond, it's not about the money. It's, I said, now imagine all that's happened. Um, imagine that uh, Bond and Mr. Big are finally together in his lair. And we're past the stunts and the women and whatever. And um, he says, you know, Mr. Bond, I think you'll, everything that's happened up to this point, he says, was just a test. It was just a test to see if you were the right person for me. And I, I think you are. And I'll tell you why. Because I think fundamentally, you'll find that I'm a people person. There's too many of them. And he pushes a button in his lair and all these monitors and screens light up with every image of overpopulation you can imagine. We've got famine in Ethiopia. You've got traffic jams in LA. You name it, it's all there. And he goes on, even lemmings, Mr. Bond, even lemmings know what to do when they grow too numerous. I'm willing to bite the bullet on a topic no politician will go near. I'm trying to save planet Earth. And I think I need your help. 007, that's, that's some kind of license, isn't it? Tell me, how much game 
are you allowed to bag with that license? Will you help me? Will you help me save planet Earth? Well, I don't have to tell you, there was dead silence and a lot of dropped jaws in that room. It hadn't been done before, and it was simple. So I went out of Eon offices, back to my waiting friend at the Dorchester, and had a very good time. Only to find the next day, oh, and I should say, he, he wanted to start a war between India and China. Okay. The two most popular, All right. two most popular countries. And I said, you know, the whole point is that here's Bond will have a foe worthy of his steel. And, you know, Bond, by the way, yes, I will help you. And, you know, their faces were all shocked. I said, don't worry. You know, he's, he's not going to really do it. The people who fell for it will be astonished. And the people who didn't fall for it will go, I knew it, I knew it. So you can't lose. But when I went back the next day, it was all gone. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how that you, monologue you guess, didn't make it in. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Can you guess why it was gone? <sighs> Nothing's popping to mind. It was too real. Oh. Yeah, I could see that. Okay. Which is unfortunate because that, that was fantastic. Yeah, and it's interesting when I, you know, reading the development of this movie, it seems like it was one where the deadline was very tight, but also that they were very determined to keep it extremely simple. Was that something that they were, um, I guess, did that sort of set the atmosphere for the environment you were kind of working in, or was all of that kind of out of your kind of purview at that point? I've told you all I know. <laughs> Well, okay. D when you saw the finished film, it, were you surprised by it? Did you see it, I guess, first of all? Of course I had to see it. All my friends were involved with it. True, true. And did you walk away... How could I not um, see <laughs> And, I mean, you had, you know, the way you described the Bond franchise, it's clear you had a decent understanding of it when you went in. Did you walk away saying, you know, like, I, I think that they, you know, that I was content with what we saw, given the history of the franchise. Wasn't my favorite Bond movie, but I should also add in the same breath that I'm not really a big James Bond fan. I can tell you why. Yeah. Go for it. It's all too cartoony for me. I like my espionage, Alfred Hitchcock style. I like it. John le Carré style. Did you guys ever read The Little Drummer Girl? Not the movies, but the novel. I have the novel, and I will be reading it. When oh, you have it on the well, podcast. Yeah. Your pillow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. Don't bother. You know, with the actual. Yeah, to the put it under the pillow. Um, yeah, it's all. It was always a little too cartoony for me. Um, I like, um, the 39 steps. I like the man who knew too much. I like North by Northwest, but even more, I think I, I like the smiley novels of Le Carre. I like a perfect spy. I love the little drummer girl. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I used to have interesting conversations with my dad about it because he loved James Bond. And I said, well, what do you love about it? And he said, well, I don't have to think. Were you uh, a fan of the Bond novels at any uh, chance? I read a couple of them, you know, when I was, I don't know, 13 years old or something. It didn't do it for me. Um, 
I, I the the real espionage stories. Have you guys read Ben McIntyre? No, I have not. Um, well, Ben McIntyre specializes in recounting. He doesn't write novels. He writes histories, and he he wrote a a book called Operation Mincemeat. Did you guys ever hear about Operation Mincemeat? The name rings a bell for sure. Yeah. It was referenced in a film we've come through at some point. Um, is it something to do with using a cadaver and to spread disinformation, something like that? Yes. Uh, uh, or have you heard about Operation Zig or Agent Zigzag? No. No, not, not that, that one. one. The, you, you, there are sort of gradations of espionage sort of stuff or categories. And I think that I was always interested and frequently appalled by the real stuff mm -hmm. and much less the fantasy pussy galore of it all, uh, which, I mean, I got nothing against pussy galore, if you know what I mean. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, Thank you. Um, but uh, it, it is the reality of spies and spying and the thin line between spy, you know, between who's a traitor and who's a hero and whether are you a spy or are you a stoolie? Mm. All those sort of gray areas really intrigue me. Um, are you familiar with Will Chambers? I recognize the name for sure, yes. Alger Hiss? No. Well, I, I suggest that you, when you ring off, maybe you Google them both, yeah. Alger Hiss and Whitaker Chambers. Bear in mind that when I was quite young, I knew Alger Hiss. Um, and those are sort of amazing stories. Operation Mincemeat, you can Google that. Mm -hmm. Agent Zigzag, you can Google that. The little drummer girl, read that book, your head will explode. Um, that's sort of the world that that absorbs me more than James Bond. I suppose that if I had to pick and choose among the James Bond movies, there are some that I like better than others. Um, but it's not a world that I inhabit comfortably. In fact, the very reason that I failed on the movie that we're discussing is evidence of that. Right. Although it's funny, I have the um, book about the, it's like the James Bond vault, and they really do credit you as helping them crack that story because they talk about the issues they were having with it. <laughs> uh, do they actually, well, I mean, they did a kind of a version of what I said, I guess. Yeah. Although I can't quite remember any of the movies. Um, my my brother-in-law Roger, who is an extremely gifted director, mm -hmm. and directed. I mean, I I met him because I saw a movie of his that so knocked my socks off that I said, "Who who made this movie?" It was called Under Fire. Have you mm -hmm. seen Under Fire? I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it for sure. Gene Hackman, Nick Nolte. Joanna Cassidy. I thought when I saw it, every American should be obliged to see this film. Right. Um, it is, you can't exactly call it a spy thriller, but it is a thriller. And it's about photojournalists who hop from war to war covering wars they're all adrenaline junkies mm -hmm. 
um, and you, you follow the best war or the war where the best food is. Um, and in this case, they wind up in Nicaragua covering the Sandinistas. And they get a little too involved. And it also, I don't know if you collect film music scores, but the score written for that movie by Jerry Goldsmith is one of the great film scores ever written. It's called Under Fire. And so, and, and Roger, he can direct anything. Um, he can direct big, he can direct small, he can direct action. Um, but I, I did not feel, and by the way, you're not meant to feel the stamp of a directorial personality on James Bond movies. Right. Mm -hmm. The star is the Bond franchise. I was actually asked way before this on another movie a few years earlier to direct a Bond movie. Oh. And I had, oh. had conversations with, with Barbara and... Is it Michael G. Wilson? Michael, yeah, Michael. Uh, and I thought, uh, I, I didn't like the odds. Um, and, and partially I sense that my tendency to sort of put a stamp or something was going to not get a lot of traction or something. I, I, it was just, a, I'm, I'm guessing, but I, I, I said, thanks, but no thanks. Do you uh, happen to recall what film they were looking to hire you for? No. A year. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Or, okay. Or even like the rough time period. Well, I don't think Pierce was, um, I think it was before Pierce. Okay. Okay. Attention, Timothy Dalton. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I did I, have a quick. I like. Oh, go you go ahead. Oh, I was just. I had a, a a Bond related question, but it just struck me when you were saying you didn't really like the unrealistic feel of of Bond. Have you caught any of the Daniel Craig films? I like Daniel Craig, uh, the John Connery, because I I sort of could halfway believe these were dangerous men, mm -hmm. um, and I. I think it's important to believe danger. W what I really liked better was Harry Palmer. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yes. I love Funeral in Berlin and I love the Ipcrest file. Okay. Wow. And where do you come down on Billion Dollar Brain? You know, I can't remember it. Um, so I can't comment. Mm -hmm. And okay. were you a fan of uh, Len Dayton's novels? Some of them. Mm hmm. Some of them, yeah, I was, I am. Well, that's interesting. And the other franchise actually I actually just want to ask you about too is the Bourne series, which goes a little more of the realistic route. It has a little bit of the blockbuster stuff you see in the Bonds, but I was just curious if those met more your fancy. They aren't quite a Harry Palmer kind of gritty aesthetic, but they do have a little more of a realistic bent to them. Oh, I got tired of people in offices saying this ends here. <laughs> That's a very fair criticism right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Well, I like I mean... Robert Donat as Richard Hatt. Right. I liked, I liked insouciant yeah. heroes who get funny the worse it got. Hmm. Uh, Richard Hannay and, and Madeline Carroll on the run in the 39 steps. Um, I just, I thought they were hilarious. And Cary Grant, you know, reaching for the doors of the Cadillac and going, locked? <laughs> uh, all those things. It's, it's uh, funny you mentioned the 39 Steps. Our episode actually came out today uh, about that film, the original uh, Robert Denae film. So, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic film. Sure wasn't this finger? Let's, let's... <laughs> That that still surprised me the first and time. And I love the fact that Mr. Memory, I love the fact that Mr. Memory was very clearly not meant to be terribly intelligent. He just 
could remember things. And he says, I don't mind telling you was the biggest job I ever undertook. Am I right, sir? And there's something about that character's psychology too, where he just can't stop himself from giving himself away, which is so fascinating as well. Yes, the 39 Steps is an organization of spies in the pay of... <laughs> you sound I, more British than I do. I love the milkman. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, why didn't you just tell me the truth? Of course you can have the code. whole story. And it's the yeah. biggest crock of shit I ever got. So, okay, okay, I'll tell you what else. There's a woman. But then I got so, Oh, mate, why didn't you say so? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a different well, kind of wish. <laughs> well, I feel like, um, you know, given your work on the Star Trek films, which I absolutely adore. I mean, words can't even express how much I've adored your Star Trek films. But Thank you. I feel like the world was robbed a little of a James Bond movie in the Nicholas Meyer mold doing what he wants to do. <laughs> totally robbed. Because I had, I, you know, I also wrote a lot of dialogue for it, which I thought was very amusing. Um, and I, I was sort of just channeling Oscar Wilde. And I remember I had one line where somebody, this girl comes up to him and says, uh, I understand you prefer your women opposite to your martinis, stirred but not shaken, or something like that. I can't remember, but I just think it's fun. <laughs> hey, I mean, you think about how many times they've tossed out those quips in those movies. Anytime someone can say something original, I mean, <laughs> that to me is money in the bank. Like, they should always chase that. So, you know. I think I'm very good. I think I'm very good at arch. <laughs> Very much so. And yeah, we're both big fans of your work. So uh, time okay. after time, we love as well. So mm -hmm. Great for film. sure. The day after. Thank you. So, but I just want to thank you so much for just taking the time to talk to us today. It's been a big thrill for both of us. And we're just greatly honored you'd swing by. I'm sorry I, I hadn't more interesting material, but I, <laughs> I did warn you. No, but you know what? You gave us information we didn't know. So that is an, a, exciting unto itself. Okay. It's not very often you get a, a famous writer and director coming on a, a little podcast like ours. So, uh, you know, we just want to thank you. Well, I didn't know you were a little podcast, so I just came on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. Take care. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So there you have it, Cam. That was our chat with Nicholas Meyer. Now, it's probably our, well, it was our first famous person on the podcast. So in terms of it making our not list, I'd say it's a, it's an easy one for me. It's a, it's a yes. Yeah, I think my sister would be greatly uh, insulted that she isn't the first famous person on this podcast, you know, having tackled Tomorrow Never Dies. But um, yes, this was ultra exciting. And again, I just can't express how much we appreciated Nicholas Meyer taking the time to talk to us and just kind of go down a little bit of a rabbit's hole talking about the, some of the spy movies we've covered on this podcast, as well as some authors that, um, you know, I think Scott, you and I have some homework to do. It seems like he, uh, he threw down the spy book and movie gauntlet for us. So uh, we, we definitely got some catching up to do. But we are so happy he took the time out to talk to us. Uh, he's clearly a busy man. He's still writing for TV and films. And we, ju we were just thrilled with what we got a chance to talk about. So Cam, what did you think about his involvement, as it turns out, in the film? I was quite surprised. I, I, I got the impression he actually done a bit more. Well, I thought there would be a maybe a closer relationship between him being brought in and his work in the past with Pierce Brosnan um, back in the 1988 film um, The Deceivers and that turned out not to be the case I was genuinely bowled over when he said that he was brought in to try to fix the villain plot and um, you know you and I had talked when we did uh, Tomorrow Never Dies on the show about how there's a twist with pretty much every Bond villain and it seemed like he would have given that character a twist that is not present in the final film. Which, you know, we spent a good portion of time singing the praises of Jonathan Price and Elliot Carver in Tomorrow Never Dies. But this take on it, I think, would have been a very interesting film. I think it would have propelled it from a lot of people's mid-tier, maybe even mid to lower tier Bond to, well, that's anything's guess after that, but it certainly would have propelled it upwards. Yeah, and I mean, 
I think I would have fought to have Nicholas Meyer play Carver, given his um, ability to deliver that monologue. Move over Jonathan Price. I don't think I ever would have said that, but uh, he, he sold me on that pitch. Yeah, and I can totally understand why he is such a go-to guy in Hollywood, often to fix these things. So you got to think as well, like he pitched this in, I guess, 96, maybe? Yeah, probably 96, yeah. Um, and he recited it to us in 2020. That's uh, 24 years later. And I was I was buying the pitch now. So he must have put some work into it then. It's so interesting to me that they were struggling with Carver of all characters because he feels like such a clean cut character in the film. I would have thought they would have been struggling more with various plot elements and tying things together. I think it's just fascinating that Carver's what was a bit of a stumbling block for them. Yeah, and I think it actually goes to show that they put a lot of effort into fixing Carver because he was one of the things that we praised when we reviewed the film. Yeah, he's one. Of, he's basically the highlight of the movie. Yeah, like we we spent a lot of time talking about Paris, about Wei Lin, and they're problematic characters in in the film. But if they brought all of these writers in to fix uh, Elliot Carver, I think they were successful. Was there anything else in the conversation we had regarding Bond that really jumped out at you? Well, there was one moment where he spoke about he was approached to direct a film mm, uh, yeah. pre-Brosnan. Uh, I, I did guess it might have been Dalton, but he wasn't sure on the years. Uh, if you're looking at sort of, I mean, when did Wrath of Khan come out? 82. And then Undiscovered Country, 91? Yeah. Yeah. So anywhere in that that range i would have said maybe that definitely puts him in the dalton brackets yeah because you have octopussy in 83 and i doubt it's that one maybe if there is a roger moore maybe view to a kill in 85 but my guess would be more like uh living daylights in 87 or L- license to kill in 89 that seems more likely doesn't it to you yeah i i feel like dalton would have been the one he's thinking about And I mean, that's a fascinating proposition in itself. Yeah, and it is interesting that he actually did go on to work with Dalton. Um, He shot a movie in 1997, um, the year that actually Tomorrow Never Dies came out, um, called The Informant, starring Timothy Dalton. There you go. So you would have had the hard-edged bond with the man who made Khan the man he is. Yeah, totally. And that's one thing that Nicholas Meyer, I feel like, has always done incredibly well, which is like fully fleshed out characters in you know very entertaining cinema like i watch star trek to the wrath of khan i watch you know um undiscovered country time after time he tends to take you know these fun premises that are just a ball and the type of thing you would see in like popcorn entertainment but he gives it that extra layer he introduces characters that have depth and i feel like really elevates the material in a big way so I would have loved to have seen what he would have done with a Bond movie because I don't think it would have been, you know, like a view to a kill. It would have been something that really did have a stamp of an auteur on it. It's interesting you say that because of the two Dalton films, I would rather have seen some changes made to The Living Daylights versus License to Kill. I feel like you and I are in the minority on this. A lot of people really love The Living Daylights, but when he talked about Carver and what does the villain want? That's something that I think that um, Living Daylights really struggles with. The two villains in that, they do have a scheme. It's quite convoluted. And I don't think either character benefits for it between, you know, um, Whitaker or um, whatever the name, uh, Jerome Crabbe's um, defecting general. Like those two characters, they feel pretty thin as Bond villains. And I really think, you know, if Nicholas Meyer, if that was indeed the film he was potentially you know, looking at, I feel like he would have brought a lot to characters like that who under, a, you know, John Glenn just feel a little thin. And yeah, let's be honest. He made me care about Kurtwood Smith with whiskers uh, glued to his face. So this man could make me care about a lot of things. Yeah. Look at what he did with Ricardo Montalban in Wrath of Khan. He made one of the greatest villains in the history of cinema. So like, I totally buy that his Bond film would have one hell of a villain in it. And that sort of uh, the, the sort of Khan way of doing things, you know, view screens, and he's never actually one on one with Kirk in Wrath of Khan. That's that perfect Bond villain because half the time they're just, you know, pontificating off screen anyway. Yeah, and it's interesting that he works on Tomorrow Never Dies 
which is a Bond uh, villain who works with screens a lot. There you go. So yeah, I'm definitely on board for the Nicholas Meyer uh, Bond film. Obviously now No Time to Die is coming out next year and they're looking to sort of reset everything. I'd say uh, Eon, Barbara, give him a call. Yeah, although I don't know that he's that interested in the call if he can't do his own thing, but I am 100% in favor of him doing his own thing. I think it'd be incredible. One thing I was somewhat surprised about and, and somewhat disheartened is that he also loves the Ipcris file. That was the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> now, the, the listeners won't know this, but we re- we recorded with video um, and the look of dismay on my face when he said it. Uh, I, I think Cam probably took a screenshot and we'll save it as, as for something down the road. <laughs> and just, you know, hearing him talk about really enjoying Funeral in Berlin and the Epcris file, that was just so joyful to me. Just to hear that there's other Harry Palmer fans out there. Ah, uh, I'll be able to sleep well tonight. I, I was waiting for him to say something like, oh, did you guys ever see Cloak and Dagger? <laughs> that would have made my day. That would have just been... <laughs> Are you guys Jack Flack fans by any chance? <laughs> Did you know I based Khan on Jack Flack? Yeah. <laughs> that timeline makes no sense. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, and it was crazy that he mentioned the 39 Steps because that's the episode at the time of this recording has just come out as well. Um, and we're big fans of that film. So it was great to hear him talk about Hitchcock for a little while. You can never plan an interview because when I sat down to do this interview with Nicholas Meyer... I did not expect that we would be talking about, you know, Harry Palmer as well as all these Hitchcock films. That was just a complete delight to me. I mean, I'll be honest, this is probably the first time I've spoke to a famous Hollywood director where I haven't just, you know, paid to meet someone as a, as a photo op or an autograph. So it was a, a very new and interesting experience for me. And I'm, I'm glad I had you by my side, Cam, to keep us on the rails because I think I would have just been a, a waffling idiot without you here, Cam. <laughs> You would be like Garth in Wayne's World when he's left on the air by himself and he's just making those high-pitched noises. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you didn't take the opportunity to say, well, that's what you're like all the time, Scott. <laughs> no, I had to go for the reference. Okay, I appreciate that. My uh, my ego is somewhat intact. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So all in all, like I think uh, you know, in the future of Spy Hearts, we are going to be looking at doing some more of these interviews with some of the creative folk we can track down online. So uh, I think this was a, I don't know, it's um, going to be tough to top this one, but uh, I guess we can try. Hey, there's always next time. That's right. So, of course, let us know what you think of our interview with Nicholas Meyer uh, on social media. You can find us at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And make sure to join us next week for The Long Kiss Goodnight, the Rennie Harlan film, which is going to be our Christmas spy movie for 2020 it was the only christmas spy film we could find so make sure you savor our potentially only ever christmas special but until next week listeners good luck among the shadows (laughs) 